Hi, this is Brian Romers talking to you about developmental influence, health promotion, and special health problems uh, for pediatric nursing. This is a bigger lecture. This is more content, and I expect you to spend some more time on this um, as your own. Um, but this is going to be an important concept of this course. So lots of major objectives with this one. So talking about growth and development, we're going to talk about play, we're going to talk about biological, psychological, cog cognitive, and social developments during these different ages and stages. We're going to talk about parent-child attachment, separation anxiety, strange or fear. We'll talk about developmental tasks in toddlerhood and other ages. We're going to talk about negativism. So that's using the word nope. We're going to talk about readiness for toilet training. We'll talk about um, you know preparing toddlers for the birth of siblings. We're going to talk about temper tantrums, we'll talk about sleep problems, fears, stresses, aggressions. We're going to recognize some of those common causes uh, of uh, stuttering. We're going to look at communicable diseases. We're going to look at you know importance of peers uh, for school age children and adolescents. We'll look at some manifestations of emotional and behavioral problems. We'll look at physical changes that occur at puberty. We'll talk about some reactions to adolescents of those physical changes at puberty. We'll outline some nursing care uh, for those with an eating disorder. And then we'll look at some of the anticipatory guidance for each developmental ages and stages. So growth and development, as we're looking through this, um, realize we've got these different subsections. So infancy, early childhood, middle childhood, later childhood, and then adolescence. So you can talk about, you know, even break it down into infancy, toddler, preschool, um, school age, pre-pubertal, and then adolescence. So, so know some of those big terms, know some of those age groups, and that will help you out. Realize that growth tends to be cephalocaudal and proximal distal. And what this means is head to toe and then end out. And so head to toe. They're going to hold their head up before they can have truncal support, before they can stand up. Um, proximal distal, they can use their big core muscles before they can use their fine motor muscles in their distals. So they can move their arm in circles well before they can use a pincer reflex and, and grasp uh, Cheerio. Physical growth. So a nice rule of thumb is that babies will grow uh, quite rapidly if you think about it. But their birth weight will double at six months and triple by a year. So if they were um, seven pounds when they were born, at six months they should be about 14 pounds. And, and at one year they'll be about 21 pounds. After infancy, um, physical growth will slow down. Um, but they still will grow two or three inches and four to six pounds a year on average, generally speaking. Um, so following figure demonstrates growth, and you're going to kind of see this, and, and at some times they really kind of take off. And then eventually they kind of taper out. So a very accurate measure of growth is going to be skeletal, um, which we don't do very frequently. We can do DEXA scans, um, looking at osseous maturation, but we don't do that usually unless we think that there's a problem going on. Temperament is an important consideration of childhood. Um, how are these kids acting? What is their temperament like? And think about all the different things that are um, components of temperament. How sensitive are they? What's their activity level? What's the intensity of the reaction that they have to things? What's their rhythmicity? What's the adapt their adaptability? What's their mood? Approach and withdrawal type of situations. What's their persistence in things? And how distractible are they? Now, think about this, not just of the child, but think about it as, um, as a whole. So think about it if they are a highly anxious person, and think about it if their parents are highly anxious. Will they butt heads more often? Will they mesh up? Will they understand each other? Um, will they fight more? Think about if they're very low sensitivity um, and adapt really quickly for both the child and the parent parents. Now this can work out well if they are on the same page. They could cause a lot of frustration that they don't understand each other if they are different. 
Um, but think about this and think about how you've met people of these different types and how they interact with each other. So you look at temperament here, you can take a quiz on your own to find your own temperament here. And then, of course, you can kind of look and see um, what, what uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics says about this um, and how parents can deal with their children more effectively. Now, of course, in pediatric, get to talk about Erickson and Piaget and Kohlberg and lots of different things like that. Um, so in this one, we're going to talk about Erickson. We're going to see child psychology throughout this um, and developmental psychology throughout. I do expect you to know what is trust versus mistrust. What is autonomy versus shame and doubt? What's initiative or guilt? What's industry versus inferiority? Identity versus role confusion. All these are very important. And think about the ages and stages and how they act. So from birth to two months, they have trust versus mistrust. Are they getting their needs met? Are you feeding them? Are you changing their diaper? Are you holding them and caring for them? Or are they not getting those things? And that's causing mistrust. Autonomy versus shame and doubt. This is that negativism. They want to do it themselves. They'll say me do a lot because they want to have that autonomy. They'll have negativism because they want to be separate. They realize that no is a very strong word and powerful word. And so are they, you know, can they be autonomous or do they have shame and doubt about being different or being about their own person? Moving on to initiative versus guilt. Can they move on and, and do things, create things, um, and be independent or, or not? Industry versus inferiority. Well, I could talk. Um, but they like creating things. They like being a part of something. Uh, they like doing things. They like school as a whole. Or they like, you know, completing something, working as a team. Um, so in the hospital setting, oftentimes they want to help out. They want to do things. Let them push the buttons. Let them help out. Let them have a chore. Let them have a task. Let them, you know, be aiding to the overall good and that will foster this industry now identity versus role confusion this is where your adolescents tend to be trying to pull away from their parents more like their peers they're trying to find who they are not who their parents see them as not as who other people see them as but who they feel that they are and so they're trying to find that way and so think about that in the role of the hospital So cognitive development, so we can talk about Piaget, so sensory motor, um, you know, versus pre-operational versus very concrete versus formal operation. So um, sensory motor, it's, you know, a lot of physical touch and direct type of situation. They don't have a lot of plans for, for going forward with this one. Concrete is kind of an interesting thing because they might be very literal in this stage. And so, you know, if you say you're going to, stick the arm they think you might put a stick in their arm um, it's very black and white and um, so they could be very literal at this stage um, formal operations is more adult like um, realize that adults or that adolescents are going into this um, they're going in and out of this um, and that's part of being an adolescent Kohlberg, so pre-conventional, so a lot of childhood is spent in pre-conventional where the obedience, um, they're just trying to avoid punishment, um, and they're trying to do things out of their self-interest. Conventional is, you know, looking at conformity, looking at social order. These are following the rules. Um, this is for what's right. So they tend to be very black and white on the rules, and you got to do something because that's what the law is. This is, I'm trying to avoid getting in trouble. This is trying to do the right thing. This, the next one is realizing that there's a lot of gray areas in the right thing. And that there are some universal human ethics. And then how do those laws play into human ethics? And what happens if the laws maybe don't agree with their ethics? So here's a nice link to help you understand those different levels. Watch this Heinz Dilemma and see what you think about, about this. But you can see the different stages of these conventional uh, pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional levels about how do you interpret this. 
self-concept, so body image and self-esteem, as they grow and develop, you develop your own self-concept and realize that, you know, a two-year-old is starting to do this. Even an infant is looking at their arm going, oh, I can control this, I can move this, this is mine. So realize that as you grow and develop, you're, you're establishing your body image and your self-esteem. So as you grow and develop, you're developing those meaningful relationships with your family members, with your friends, with significant others. Realize that these are changing throughout their, their growth and development. So, and this impacts, you know, their sense of self, of control, their moral worth, um, their love, their acceptance, all those things, and how that imp impacts who they are. Now, play is very important. Well, I know I've talked to you about this before, but play is the work of the child. Um, realize this is how they interact with their world. So, lots of different ways. Onlooker play is that they're watching somebody else play. They're not really involved with this. They're not really doing it. So, think about an infant watching like somebody else play with blocks. So, like an older sibling. Solitary play, they're playing with blocks by themselves. Parallel play, so like two kindergartners, and they both are playing blocks. They're not playing with each other, though. Um, they're both playing blocks, but they're playing in their own little realm. Associative play, this is later on in the school year, uh, where they're both playing with cars, and they're interacting back and forth with each other. Um, I'll share this. Can I have that? Those type of situations. And then cooperative play is later in school when they have rules, and they're they're helping each other out with that. So think about those different functions of play. Think about all the things that they do. Um, you know, play is exploring the world. Play is um, trying to understand something. Um, and, and play can be fun. So, um, watch screen time with this. This is kind of a heated discussion with this one. Um, now, usually the one and two hours of screen time is not talking about FaceTiming grandma, grandpa, those kind of social interactions like that, but it's watching shows and doing those kind of things. And a lot of the research that's out there is saying that it's very detrimental to brain development. Um, and so you really should limit them to one to two hours of screen time per day. Now, we're going to kind of go into different systems. So, infant and family will be first. So, um, you can link into this. This is Bright Futures. This is a great resource for, like, if you have them in a family practice office and they're coming in for, and this is going to be, what do you need to assess at this age and this stage? What immunizations do they need? What kind of screening do they need? Do they need labs at this point in time? Um, but think about where they're at for your, their growth and development. So remember, for an infant, you know, double their weight for six months, triple it at one year of age. Um, looking at head circumference, it's very important to monitor growth. Look at length and how that's important. Uh, maturation of systems is occurring, so they're growing, they're developing their heart rate. As they get older, their heart rate's going to slow down, and their respirators will slow down, their blood pressures will go up, and all that's completely normal. So just kind of think about Get your normals for this. Realize that some kids can be 160 when they're resting, up to 220 if they're angry. So their heart rate's going to be, you know, significantly faster than the adult population. Respiratory rate could be, you know, 20s to 30s, and that's all right. So blood pressure is going to be on the lower side of this. Maybe they're 70s over 30s. So realize that, that they're going to kind of do some of this stuff. Um, realize that they're also going to lose their maternal iron stores. And this is an important concept because um, after they're born, they're going to go have a physiological anemia as they as they wean through their iron store. So if they're not getting supplemental iron, uh, they could get anemic from this. Very common, especially as they transition from formula um, into whole milk at one year of age. So they're going to be depleted of their stores, switching over to things that don't have any iron in them. And so if they're not taking good finger foods and supplemented cereals, uh, or cereals that are supplemented with iron, they can get anemic, and that's very common. Digestion is not very refined. 
Um, their, their body is still making the enzymes to break things down. Um, and so some food is not really broken down that well. Um, Liver is immature. Kidneys are immature. Their IgG is not mature at all. So they are at higher risk for infection. Thermal regulation is not well defined yet. So they cannot balance their, their temperatures very well. And so as they get older, that improves, but realize that infants have a difficulty with their temps. And finally, their vision. Um, they don't really establish it until about four months of age for their having um, a binocular vision. So there's a lot of growth and development at this age and stage. For gross motor, fine motor, so babies can grasp, they get start getting head control. So really look at these things and try and you know do that cephalocaudal but realize these gross and fine motor things are very um, important to you they will be tested on underneath your resources tab i do have a little handout for you for each of these stages and stages that will hopefully uh, provide you with a resource to study so look at that and make sure you utilize that for your upcoming test um, but a big part of peds is knowing what they can do and when they can do it. You know, infants can roll from the abdomen to the back at five months and back to abdomen at six months. Um, they can sit unsupported, or they can sit supported at four, unsupported by seven, and then afterwards at six months they start crawling. That progresses to watch, walking and holding furniture, um, you know, and then walking independently uh, by about 12 to 15 months. So looking at that trust versus mistrust, you can click on this if you want a refresher on that and looking at that sensory motor stage. Social development, so stranger anxiety is very real. So at four months of age, they tend to, to have this very significantly. If they don't, I get a little concerned about them. Um, but think about how this progresses. And so from you know four months of age up to about two years of old, um, they are very nervous around strangers, including nurses and doctors and people that they do not know. And so how they act is very normal. And so they're usually not too happy to see us. So um, think about stranger anxiety, especially in your hospital. Think about how we can work with that. If they've got separation anxiety, how or what kind of things can we do for them? So can we give them blankets, teddy bears, anything that reminds them of home, and try and help them out with this. Anticipatory guidance as they're going through the stage, think about the next thing. So as they go into toddlerhood, what are they going to do? What's their nutrition? What's their sleep period like? What's what do we talk about with child care? When do they get teeth? So all these things are important anticipatory guidance factors because parents want to know what's next. And if we can kind of tell them what's next, then they can help get ready. Especially as they're going into, okay, well, you know, before your baby, you'd put them down and they would stay still. Now they're going to start crawling. Now they're going to start walking. Now you need to protect them from falling down the stairs and outlets and uh, chemicals and burns and those kind of situations like that that they might get themselves into. So as we go into the next ages and stages, so toddlers, so they still they slow down in their growth and development, but it's still pretty significant. Um, you know, they gain four to six pounds um, between 12 and 36, and about three inches every year. Um, at about two years of age, they're about half of their adult height, which I think is an interesting finding. So growth and fine amount, fine motor development, so they can they can walk by about a year of age run by 18 months. Um, they can jump with both feet by about two and a half. They can grasp a small item by about 12 and release it by about uh, 15 months. Um, by about three years of age, they can ride a trike, just different things like that. So look at their autonomy versus shame and doubt. So Erickson's is kicking in again. So how do they become their own person and how if they are not accomplishing that, they might have some shame and doubt with that. So, talk your sensory motive, 
um, and how that's transitioning pre-operational pre phases of Piaget. So they're getting that self-awareness, body image, describing their own gender and what that gender means to them. Um, they're going to have their language development where their languages are really taking off. They're learning words and they're, um, it's just exploding um, on the things that they can do. Anticipatory guidance for this teenage or this uh, toddler years. Um, potty training is a big thing. How do you know if the kids are ready? Um, what are some techniques? So how do you know if they're ready? Um, if they can take a nap and they don't have a wet diaper, if they seem to know after they've gone to the bathroom that they need a new diaper, if it seems to bother them, if they go into the corner to go to the bathroom um, and don't want you aware of it, those are some signs that they might be ready to potty train. And usually peeing is before pooping. Um, we'll just, you know, every kid's a little different. Some techniques are, um, you know, I've heard take the diapers off, and so don't have that as a technique and have them sit frequently. So every hour you have them sit on the, on the potty. Um, you can sit with them so they get used to that. You can have them have their own little toilet chair so it's a special thing for them. You can reward them if they do go potty in the toilet. Um, sometimes little kids like to hit the floating Cheerios so little boys like a target to aim at sometimes. So sometimes that can be fun. Um, but realize that you know toilet training is a major component at this age and stage. Um, sibling rivalry can happen, regression. So if they're stressed out, if they go to the hospital, the things that they used to be able to do, they might not do at that point in time when they're really stressed out. Temper tensions are very common at this type. Um, so you can try and rationalize with them. You can try and talk them through in a calm manner. You can try and remove them from that situation. You can try to ignore them. Um, there's lots of different things that you can do for temper tantrums. Uh, think about their nutrition. What do they need to eat? How much do they need to sleep? Dental health. Uh, get them into the dentist and just get it started. Um, and get them used to being in the dentist's office. Um, car safety is another big thing. Um, as you're talking about infants, it's always in a car seat, rear facing, in the middle of the back seat. Um, with, with this at about two years of age, um, you can start thinking about flipping them over and there's official guidelines for this based on age and weight and those kind of things um, but you want to make sure that they are meeting those guidelines otherwise they don't have the head control and if you flip them around so that they're forward facing that puts them at risk for for damage during an accident physical growth so as we're talking about preschoolers right now um, Think about what their weight is. Think about what their height is. Um, think about how much they gain. So it's not as much as toddlers, not as much as, in, uh, as infants, but it's still significant at this age. Think about the gross and fine motor skills. So, um, you know, like I said before, a 36-month-old riding a trike, that's a big thing. They like to task. So think about three years, three wheels, um, and they can do that. Um, but as they're getting older, think about those skills that they can do. When can they stand on one leg? When can they hop? When can they jump? Those kind of situations. Um, once again, Ericsson's and Piaget's, and make sure you're able to utilize those appropriately. Uh, preschoolers believe that their words have power and their thoughts have power. And so they might believe in some magical thinking that, you know, if they wish somebody some harm or wish bad upon somebody, and that happens, then of course they think that they did that. Um, they do tend to be very egocentric, same as toddlers, and they think about themselves. They don't necessarily think about others. When they bite somebody else, they don't really have a clue that that hurts them when they bite them. Um, moral development, pretty rudimentary. Um, not seen a lot yet in the preschool years. Um, Sex typing, you know, they are kind of big on what do guys do, what do women do. Um, this can be based on the family household that they're in. Um, but realize that this is an important thing with this. And so they might start asking different questions about boy parts and girl parts. And so they might have to you get to have those talks with them. So... 
Um, behavioral and play, and that's very important in this group. They're growing, developing, um, and learning how to play with others. And that's important concepts of this. Fear for a preschooler, um, you know, definitely being away from parents, um, bodily injury, those kind of situations. Aggression, kids will bite in, in this situation. It's kind of common at this age. Uh, they'll hit, they'll do those kind of things. Um, it, it's kind of a matter of how frequent they're doing it, though. Um, stuttering is a speech problem that's very common during this time period. Um, don't need to act on it quite yet. Um, but usually if they're getting older, age 7 or so, then we start getting more concerned about that. Anticipatory guidance, so looking at nutrition, sleep, dental care, injury prevention. So accidents are still one of the leading causes of death, uh, morbidity, and mortality at those ages. So think about the different things that keep them safe. As they're starting to go to daycares and schools, they're around more people, and of course infectious disease is more of a concern. And so try and think of ways to keep them safe. And this is going to include immunizations, washing hands, and doing those kind of situations. So school age physical growth, they're growing still. Um, you know, think about when it's time to get into a booster seat. When can they get out of it? Know South Dakota's laws on this one and look at the guidance here. So you're, it's weight based, it's height based. Um, and think about that, think about safety issues. So industry versus inferiority, and how do you promote that? Think about PJ's concrete operations, and what do they learn about conservation? So conservation is when you take fluid from one cup and pour it into a different cup, even if they look differently, you're realizing the fluid is staying the same. So if you've got a really wide cup versus a very narrow cup, they'll understand that that's the same fluid volume um, and before that they would think that whatever one's taller has got more fluid in it. Um, moral development progresses they tend to kind of be black and white during this uh, time period and following the rules that way if you're ever playing board games with school agers realize that they tend to be sticklers on the rules that's that's not the rules you can't play it that way. So think about activities and relationships the games that they play, um, how are they gaining independence from their parents, and how are they developing their own self-concept. So just for guidance, you know, think of how important school is to them, both the academic and the social aspects of it. What's their self, um, their care after school? You know, not many kids are latchkey kids anymore. Um, but where are they going to go? What are they going to do? Are they able to ride a bus? Are they walking to daycare? What, what are those things that they do? Limit setting. So what do we do with this for punishments? If they have, um, you know, a need for corrections, often losing privileges is effective at this age. What's stressful to them? What's How's their nutrition? How's their sleep activity? Sports is important. How do we keep them safe in these sports? Um, talk about sex ed already and and you know the private parts and different discussions like that so adolescence this is when you're going to see some of the growth um, so women tend to mature faster than boys and so they'll they'll hit their puberty a little bit earlier than guys will and you kind of see the growth and development here um, realize that adolescents struggle with acne because they're starting to get sebaceous sweat glands and as such um, they tend to clog up a little bit more. That also is part of their body odor with this. And so realize those hormones and their body changes like that. And that leads into those, you know, acne and body odor. All right, so think about where we're at for Piaget and Erickson's and those kind of situations. What group of people have highly influential adolescents? Of course, it's their peers. They want to be a part of a group. Um, they learn their role identity from media and peers and their parents um, as they're trying to find their way. Think about all the different ways that their self-concept and body image is being controlled. Um, social media, TikTok, uh, all the different things, chat, uh, chats that they're on um, and how that impact them. Also think about the world that we live in and the use of AIs and the use of 
uh, Photoshop and how a lot of our images are not real. And so how that puts them into unrealistic expectations of what they can obtain and what, what a normal body image is. So, um, realize that they can be more emotional. They fluctuate in between um, child and adult thinking. That's been proven on multiple MRIs. They don't have any control over this, but just realize that they can alternate and vacillate between adult and childlike behavior, and that can get them into trouble sometimes. So anticipatory guidance, they're going to need some immunizations. Think about the nutrition that they have. They don't always make good choices for the foods that they have. Think about the sleep, and hopefully that they're getting some. Um, activity and exercise, dental health, all these uh, situations in the adolescence. Think about substance abuse, sexuality, injury prevention, motor vehicles, drugs, sex, all that kind of stuff um, as they're exploring. Um, there's a section on eating disorders, and it's unfortunately too common at this age and stage. So kind of watch for that kind of stuff. Um, so when you're taking your histories on adults, it's an important thing to consider. Um, just like all these other aspects of sexuality, substance abuse, smoking, um, you know, um, and hazardous things like how fast do you drive, um, et cetera, et cetera, around guns, around these other issues. Well, that ends this. I know it's very long, and I know it's kind of an abbreviated version. Um, there's lots to learn about development. So read through these chapters very, very closely. And then also, like I said before, look at that re the resources um, for these different ages and stages um, and try to memorize it as much as possible. So if you have questions with this, please contact me, um, and I'm happy to help. All right, have a great day.